The Kid in the Ambulance Written by Suki Litchfield You're gonna be okay, I told the boy. It's what I tell all the patients, whether it's true or not. The kid had no reaction. I wasn't expecting one. He hadn't answered my questions about his name or who the president was either. He just stared at the ceiling with wide, dark eyes. A woman had called in a kid walking in the dark along the side of a road in the snow. When we arrived, he was standing at the edge of the caller's headlights. He wore a t-shirt and those shorts we used to call jams. She'd given him a granola bar. It was all I had in my car, she apologized. And it was in his hand, unopened, the foil wrapper reflecting the flickering ambulance lights. He let me lead him around to the back, and at my request, he lay down on the stretcher and let me immobilize his head. He didn't react to being strapped down, or to the rear door slamming, or to Heather putting on the sirens long enough to get us through an intersection. His vitals were fine, so keeping him comfortable during transport was all I could do for him. Privately, I had my doubts about him being okay. Where did you come from? I asked, just to keep up the soothing patter. He mumbled, Cold. I tried not to react when he spoke. I busied myself reaching for a foil blanket, even though I had already put one over him. You're cold? No, he said, and he pulled his eyebrows into a frown. It was the first facial expression I'd seen him make. It was cold, where I was, and dark, I think. His eyes, wide and brown, found mine. I don't remember. It's okay, I told him. I was supposed to fill out an intake sheet during the ride, but I'd abandoned it when it was clear he wasn't going to talk. I grabbed the clipboard now. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan what? Barrett. I looked at his face. Although some clarity was starting to settle into his eyes, his face was still blank. Concussion, I guessed. What's your address, bud? 104 Lincoln Street. I can't move my arms. It's the seatbelt. We'll be there soon, I said through a dry mouth. I could feel us arrive. Heather always takes the hospital corner too hard. And seconds later, we were rolling the kid out of the ambulance, and the nurses were rolling him into the building. Instead of following, I stared after them. Heather looked from the doors whooshing shut to me. So we're just going to leave the stretcher? The kid said his name is Ryan Barrett, I said. Jesus, Heather said. Who would name their baby after a dead kid? The walkie on her shoulder began to squawk, and she flicked me on the arm. Go get the stretcher. I don't remember what our next call was. Something stupid, probably. But we didn't wind up returning to the hospital the rest of the night. We heard afterwards about Ryan's mom showing up. About how she wouldn't look at the kid's face until she'd seen the birthmark on his back. About how she started crying and screaming about miracles. After my shift ended, I felt wired, so I went to my parents' house. I brought in the mail they kept getting, even though they were in Florida for the winter. Then I knelt on the floor of my old bedroom and dug through Rubbermaid tubs until I found my third grade school picture. Three rows of kids stood on risers next to a startlingly young Mrs. Greer, my eyes immediately went to me, smiling crookedly in my turtleneck on the tallest riser. Ryan was in the middle row, wearing a plaid shirt I thought I remembered. His smile was big, his eyes clear. He looked happy and fearless. I brought the picture in to show Heather the next night. 
We'd park the ambulance in the CVS parking lot across from the hospital while we waited for a call. When I handed her the picture, she snorted and shook her head. She was in the front row, her hair in braids. Do not show this to my wife. Do you see him? Yeah. The afternoon Ryan disappeared, he was on his way to my house. Police found his bike, but not him. I remembered Ed McLean, who was a sergeant then, came to my house to interview me. We sat on the couch while my dad read the newspaper in his armchair in the corner. Ed assured me I was not in trouble, but did I know any place else Ryan would have gone? Did he have any secret friends? Any secrets at all? Did you find his boombox? I asked. That was the summer we were listening to Born in the USA nonstop. I was picturing Ryan in the woods, trapped beneath a tree or something. If the cops just listened for the music, it was with his bike, he said kindly. Then my dad, without looking up from his newspaper, said, I think that's about enough, Ed. And he left. The newspaper prints a remembrance on August 11th every year. All through high school, they had those creepy age progression photos, but they haven't done that in a while. Everyone else standing on the risers beside Mrs. Greer grew up, graduated, got jobs. Most of them married. Some of them even left town. Ryan and I spent our childhood riding our bikes wherever we wanted, building forts in the woods, going from neighborhood to neighborhood seeking out snowball fights or kids with new video games. Now I don't let my children go outside without me. Ryan's disappearance is why. It's probably the reason for a lot of other things, too, like how I spent my marriage expecting my wife to leave me, or how I picked a job that sometimes lets me save people. I still have like eight of those black plastic combs, Heather said, handing the school picture back to me. So are we thinking aliens? I asked. She sighed. Or he's an imposter. He's ten. Some adult playing a sick game? But word floated over from the police department that his fingerprints had checked out. A lot of people in town were going with aliens. My daughter's basketball coach suggested Ryan had just escaped a government lab. Heather's wife's sister insisted it was cosmetics companies testing anti-aging serums. Ryan's mother wasn't speaking publicly, but she told the nurses that he had been with the angels all this time. So what? Heather said. He got kicked out of heaven? The FBI came to town, and TV news. To this day, my ex insists she saw Diane Sawyer at Dairy Queen. But like Ryan's mother, the police made no statements. Once he left the hospital, where an orderly had been fired and a resident reprimanded for taking surreptitious pictures of the kid, there was no news at all. I thought about going to visit, but I didn't. Even if his mother allowed me to see him, I couldn't imagine it going well. I pictured us sitting alone in a room while I tried not to look sad, and he tried not to look horrified at my receding hairline and beer gut. People saw them a few times, Ryan pushing his mom's cart in the grocery store, sitting beside her in church. For the most part, they seemed to stay in the house, it was on the market by spring. I actually assumed they had already moved by the time I saw him again. My son was finally big enough to switch to a backless booster seat, and I was switching them out when I heard the crunch of bike tires on rocks at the end of the driveway. When I straightened up, I saw him there. He was standing still, straddling the bike, 
His helmet dangled from the handlebars in the spot where he used to hook his boombox. He didn't say anything or look in my direction. After a moment, I called. Your mom got you a new bike, huh? Yeah, he said. Then, we're moving. I wondered if they would be changing their names. I hoped so. I didn't know what to say, so I went with my go-to. You're gonna be okay. He stood there another second, and then he rode off. That was the last I saw of him. I regret it so much. I wish I'd asked him to ride bikes. I should have dragged my dusty ten-speed out of the garage while he made fun of it, and then we could have raced around town. We could have spent the morning screaming the words to Born in the USA and laughing until we were breathless. Ten years old, totally awesome, and completely safe. <laughs>